have your Bible with you, will you please turn with me to the book of Genesis, chapter 29. We're going to look at just a few verses there, verses 31 through 35. We're going to take a break from our study in the book of Mark and Luke. By the way, we are getting ready to go back into the Gospels here real soon, but today we're going to be looking at Genesis 29, and the title of my message tonight is Looking for Love. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this privilege now to know as we study your word that you love us with an everlasting love. And Father, you also know the hearts that are even right now wounded, looking for love, desiring to be loved, but also wondering if they're lovable. Father, as we study your word tonight, I pray that you will deeply minister to every heart and strengthen every life Heal every wound as we come to understand how great your love is for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen and amen. Well, you know, during this COVID-19 crisis, the stay-at-home order, one benefit has been extra time with family. And I have truly enjoyed my time with my wife, Heidi, our seven-year-old daughter, Melina, and just interacting with kids. I tell you what, it's so funny. And I love to hear the things that come out of Melina's mouth. She shocks me. She surprises me. She makes me laugh. Great insights. I love to hear what she has to say. I love to hear what kids have to say. Just to hear what is going on in their mind and how they're processing things. And the other day, I came across this thing where it kind of gave some quotes about kids talking about love, kids talking about love and marriage, kids between the ages of five and 10. So I thought, you know what, to lighten things up a little bit, I'd like to share with you some of these funny quotes from kids who are talking about love. Manuel, he's eight years old. He wrote, I think you're supposed to get shot when it comes to love with an arrow or something, but the rest of it isn't supposed to be so painful. Great word there, Manuel. How about Carolyn, age eight? She wrote, my mother says to look for a man who is kind. That's what I'll do. I'll find somebody who's kind of tall and kind of handsome. There you go. And then Brian, age seven, he said, It isn't always how you look. Look at me. I'm handsome like anything, and I haven't got anybody to marry me yet. Now, I especially like five-year-old Tom. This guy is on on a mission. He knows what he wants in life. He says this, once I'm done with kindergarten, I'm gonna find me a wife. There you go. You go get him, Tom. And then lastly, Kirsten 10, she said, no person really decides before they grow up who they're going to marry. God decides it all way before. And you get to find out later who you're stuck with. There you go, Kirsten. You know, like all children, we all have a sense of what love should look like. And in many ways, love really is a simple concept. And yet maybe you've noticed like I have, it can get really complicated in our fallen world. And the question is, is it possible to find true love? And tonight we're going to look at someone who longed to be loved, but never was, yet discovered how to be released from looking for unconditional love in a very conditional world. Let's begin in verse 31 of Genesis 29. Now the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, and he opened her womb. But Rachel was barren. Leah conceived and bore a son and named him Reuben. For she said, because the Lord has seen my affliction, surely now my husband will love me. Then she conceived again and bore a son and said, because the Lord has heard that I am unloved, he has therefore given me this son also. So she named him Simeon. She conceived again. And bore a son and said, now this time my husband will become attached to me because I have borne him three sons. Therefore, he was named Levi. And she conceived again and bore a son and said, this time I will praise the Lord. Therefore, she named him Judah. 
Then she stopped bearing. The first thing when it comes to looking for love that we discover from this passage and just discover from life in general is this. All of us want to be loved. As I mentioned just a moment ago, we have this sense of what love should be like, what love does look like, true love. It's unconditional. It's vulnerable. I can be open. I can express who I am and be accepted right where I am at without any strings attached. All of us want and earnestly desire that kind of love. The problem is we seek unconditional love conditionally. And we see that right here with Leah. Now, Jacob, he wanted to marry Rachel, Leah's younger sister. And we're told in verse 17 that Rachel was beautiful of form and face. But to put it kindly, Leah was not Jacob's type. Now, Jacob brought nothing with him when he fled from Esau after deceiving his father Isaac for the blessing, according to Genesis chapter 27. So when he comes to Uncle Laban, his relative, he offered to work seven years to Laban to earn Rachel's hand in marriage. And those days seemed like nothing. Those years seemed like nothing because he loved her so very, very much. And so after working seven years for Laban, Jacob's day had finally arrived to marry the girl of his dreams. But Uncle Laban played a fast one. Under the veil of night, he switched out. He pulled away the bride, Rachel, and in her place, put in the older sister, Leah, for that first night together. And when Jacob wakes up in the morning, he realized he had a living nightmare on his hands. Now, the question that strikes me as I look at this is, why did Leah go along with Daddy Laban's scheme? Well, perhaps she felt compelled to submit to her father's authority. Maybe she was tired of playing second fiddle to her beautiful sister, Rachel. Or maybe she just thought this was her last chance for romance. You know, we really don't know the reasons why, but one thing stands out as we read these verses. Leah wanted to be loved and badly. Now to Jacob, Leah was a burden, a bother. She was a dirty, rotten trick. And it didn't take great discernment to see that his heart was with her beautiful sister, Rachel. Daily, Leah was reminded of the fact that she was still second fiddle in an orchestra that had room for only one. And then we come to verse 31, and we're told that the Lord saw this too. Very important. So he opened Leah's womb to conceive, but closed Rachel's womb, and she was barren. And I'm convinced that the very moment Leah realized that she was pregnant, she was thinking, I am second fiddle to my sister no more. I will truly be loved by my husband. You see, in that culture, bearing children was considered a blessing from God. And to bear a son, to bring forth a son, was even better. But there's application for us in all of this. True love does not come with conditions. But here's the thing. We live as though it does. Let me give you a test question. Have you ever had someone say to you, I love you, but then your response is, or maybe you wonder without saying, why? Why do you love me? Your answer, if you answered yes, reveals the nature of the problem right there. You're seeking unconditional love in a conditional way. You know, it's like, if I'm just smart enough, then I'll be loved. If I've got enough money, well, then I'll be loved and I'm worthy to be loved. 
if I'm handsome or if I'm pretty, then I'll be loved. But you know, what I see in all of that is that basically you're saying, if I'm not who I am, then I'm worthy to be loved. And that's so wrong because God loves you just the way you are. We can't seek unconditional love on conditional terms and grounds. But it reminds me of a funny story about this middle-aged woman who had a heart attack. Now, let me assure you, that's not the funny part, okay? But she had a heart attack. She was taken to the hospital. And while she's on the operating table, she had a near-death experience. So she's in God's presence. And she asks him the big question, is this it? And God replies and says, no, I'm sending you back. You have another 40 years, two months, and eight days to live. So the gal's revived, and upon recovery, she decides to stay in the hospital and get a facelift, liposuction, a tummy tuck. She even had a hairdresser come into the hospital before she was released to change her hair color because she's thinking, you know what? If I've got a long life to live, I might as well go for it and make the most of it. So she leaves the hospital after all the recovery from all the operations, and she's crossing the street, and she's hit by an ambulance and killed instantly. Well, so she's right back into God's presence again, and she demands from God, I thought you said I had another 40 years to live. What happened? And God said to her, I didn't recognize you. Here's the problem. We live in a conditional world that loves conditionally. And if you're not careful, it will suck you right into thinking the same way. I remember seeing that with my brother, Mike. I saw what happened to him during his college football years at the University of Washington. He eventually transferred, went on to Boise State, became number one in the nation, field goal kicking, all American. But at University of Washington, he had some struggles. And there was this one particular game against Colorado on ABC Sports, halftime, opportunity for him to kick a field goal and put the team ahead, and he misses. And the head coach of the team begins to talk negatively about my brother. And it was a spiral from that point on. He did it on national TV, radio interviews. It just began to spiral. You see, the, the team had aspirations of a national championship. They couldn't have my brother holding them back. They didn't even have the nerve to tell him to his face. He had to hear on the radio that he had lost his position to another kicker who could never beat him in practice. I remember going out to a game to support my brother. I had my dad with me in the stands and hearing people talk about my brother negative. Oh, sure, they loved him when he was doing well earlier in the season and helped them beat the USC Trojans. But when things got difficult, how quickly they forgot about him and wanted to replace him with someone else. Our world is a very conditional world. And it's been rightly said that you can never change another person. But it's also true, as we see here, that you cannot make someone love you. It just never works. You cannot make someone love you. Leah conceived and gave birth to her first son. And Leah knew that the Lord had opened her womb. She knew that the Lord had seen her affliction or misery. What did the Lord see? The same thing that everybody else saw, including Leah. That Jacob, oh, his eyes would light up whenever Rachel came his way. But whenever he saw Leah coming, he had that, what do you want now? Look in his eyes. Leah, verse 32, gave Jacob his very first son. And his name is revealing. The name Reuben means, see, a son. L literally, Leah was saying, see, I have value now. Will you love me, Jacob? But I think it's interesting who named the boy? Not Jacob, Leah. Now, 
when you compare Jacob to Abraham, well, he named Ishmael, and he also named Isaac. And together, Isaac and Rebekah named their sons Esau and Jacob. So where was Jacob? Tending the flocks? Did he not notice his new son? Did he not care? Or was the boy just another mouth to feed? A burden, a bother, just like his mother. The bottom line is, Jacob's heart for Leah didn't change. But here's the thing, and I want to encourage you with this. If you do not feel loved right now, Jacob may not have noticed, but God took notice, and he always does. He knows, he sees, he's mindful of all that we're going through. In fact, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13 tells us, and there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. It didn't stop there. Verse 33, Leah gave Jacob a second son. And once again, Leah acknowledged God's hand while hoping, hoping this time she would be valued and loved by her husband. She declared, because the Lord has heard that I am unloved, which begs the question, what in fact did the Lord hear? Well, the Lord heard what was said. And he also heard how things were said. But he also took notice of what should have been said, but never was said. He heard it all. I mean, just think about this. When, in light of what we see here, did Leah likely ever hear Jacob say that he loved her? Hold on tight when I tell you this. Probably the night she pretended to be her sister, Rachel. If that doesn't break your heart, I don't know what will. So she names her boy Simeon, which means hurt. And she's thinking, even if Jacob wasn't listening, I know God is. And that also is a good word for us as well. When we're going through trials and difficulties, our God is a God who sees and our God is a God who hears and our God is a God who knows. Israel, they were being punished by the pharaohs in Exodus chapter two. And the cry, the cry because of the slavery just began to rise up into the very presence of God and God began to move. We're told this in Exodus chapter two, verse 23. And the sons of Israel sighed because of the bondage and they cried out and their cry for help because of their bondage rose up to God. You know, it's really easy to take to social media and complain. It's real easy to complain to friends, family, neighbors. I think it's so important for us to take those hurts, those pains, those wounds, the ones that God sees and hears, and offer it to the Lord in prayer. Because really, he's the one who can do something about it. Bring it to the Lord in prayer. He loves you. Next, we see in verse 34, Leah gave Jacob a third son. Again, the Lord opened her womb to conceive. Now Leah's in the bonus round. If she were playing hockey, it's a hat trick. Three sons. She's doing really well here. She is blessed. God is making it clear. His favor is upon her. Surely, surely Jacob would stop and turn and become attached to his wife now. What do we see in all of this? Leah desired a deeper connection to her husband. She wanted to have her husband's heart. And so she named the boy Levi, which means joined to. She's giving Jacob an invitation. Please, my heart is wide open to you. Jacob, please open up your heart to me. But Jacob became even more distant. Why? Because you cannot make someone love you. Not to be crass, 
not to be rude or crude. But here's the deal. Having sex will not make someone love you, though many people have tried. Sex produces children. It doesn't always produce love. You see, sex in the context of a godly marriage under the covering of God's love, that's where freedom and love unconditionally is found. That's where sex is meant to be enjoyed. But just having sex to try to make someone love you, it will never, ever work. Hey, getting physically fit is a good thing because we're a temple of the Holy Spirit. But getting fit just to be loved, it's a dead end. And I believe we should seek to grow in all aspects of our lives. But here's the deal. If we're doing it for the approval of man, it's a dead end. Rather, we should do it to please God. That was the heart of the Apostle Paul when he wrote in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 9, therefore we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to God. I can't please everybody. Oh, but guess what? God will welcome a heart of faith, a heart that desires to honor and please him, and he is pleased by such things. You know, I have to confess, when I read this story, it's painful. I continually find myself wishing for this fairy tale ending that somehow Jacob would love Leah. But the truth is, it never happened. Yet, unconditional love does exist. And it's a love that's not of this world, but it was around well before the world ever existed. And the second point we want to capture here for those looking for love is this. I alluded to it earlier, kind of tipped my hand, but now I'm going to give it to you completely. God loves you unconditionally. If you're with others in the room right now, God loves them too, unconditionally. God doesn't have a checklist. And once we meet our quota of lovable things to do, of of lovable ways to live, then all of a sudden he somehow loves us more or will now take us in. God loves you and me unconditionally before we ever did anything right or wrong. God has loved us and continues to love us. God has always loved you, always. God has always loved you before you ever did anything right or wrong. Leah, she eagerly longed for Jacob's love, but the Lord had loved her from the beginning. God knew what she was going through. He saw, heard, and he opened her womb to show her that he loved her even though her husband did not. God's love is an everlasting love. Jeremiah 31 verse 3 tells us that, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have drawn you with loving kindness. And I want you to look at these words here. Let these words sink into your heart. You see, God's loved you and me with an everlasting and eternal love. And with that eternal, unconditional love, God wants to do something. He wants to draw you into a relationship with himself. The safest place to be where you may come as you are and experience the love of God. His love is an unconditional love. His love is a transforming love. His love is a liberating love. His love is a holy love. He loves each and every one of us unconditionally, and he always has. And for Leah, it took a while, but she finally figured it out. What did she figure out? To accept God's love. Why? Because he has accepted you. That's a choice that we need to make. Accept God's love because he has accepted you. Oh, but I'm not 
smart. I'm not wealthy. I'm not handsome. I'm not fit. I'm not this. I'm not that. God loves you. And the choice is yours. Will you accept his love? Verse 35, Leah gave Jacob a fourth son. And she called him Judah. And I love the name. It means praise. But notice the pivot here. So important. She said, this time I will praise the Lord. All the other times I'm trying to draw my husband to me. But this time she's saying, I'm done. I'm going to praise the Lord. Here we have the high point of Leah's faith. You can hear the freedom in her words. She's basically saying, I'm not going to live like this anymore. I'm going to praise the one who has always loved me. And I'm going to praise the one who loves me unconditionally. And here's the thing. It can be true for you too. You can say with Leah, this time, I will praise the Lord. No matter what comes my way, no matter what people think of me, I belong to the Lord. Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sin. I received him as my savior. I am a child of God and he loves me. And there are no favorites in the family of God. He loves all of his children equally and desires all of his children to be built up in his love. You know, When you look at the Bible, you see over and over again, this idea of God's love. And God's just shouting from the heavens, I love you. And it's so important for us to be reminded of that because it's easy in our fallen world to begin to forget or even question God's love. And I can tell you as a dad, I always want my kids to know how much I love them. With Melina, started very, very young. We even made it a game. She would say, I love you, Daddy. And I'd say, I love you more. Well, then she got very competitive. And she said, well, I love you to infinity as she got a little bit smarter. And I said, well, I love you to infinity and beyond. But the whole point of it is this. I want my daughter, whether I'm with her or not, to always know that she's the apple of my eye the treasure of my heart. I love her. And I think that if I feel that way about my daughter, how much more our heavenly father feels that way about his children. It's so important. How much does God love us? Do you know how much God loves you? I believe if we really understood how much God loves us, it would radically change our lives. And here's what's so amazing. We don't have to guess how much because the Bible tells us how much God loves us. We see this right before Jesus was betrayed in John chapter 17, his high priestly prayer. I want to look at a portion of it, verses 22 through 23. Here, Jesus is praying to the Father, for the disciples. And he says, the glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one. Just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you have loved me. Did you see that last part right there? Jesus said that you love Them, meaning you and me, all who are born again believers, washed under the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus is saying that you love them even as you love me. How much does the Father love us? As much as he loves Jesus. Try that one on for size. Let that one settle into your heart. Maybe you're like me. It's like drinking a Slurpee real fast and you get a brain freeze. It's overwhelming to think that God can love me. I mean, what's there not to love about Jesus? I can completely understand loving Jesus. He's perfect. He always did what the Father told him to do and always said what the Father told him to say. That's not me. I've made plenty of mistakes. How could God love me? 
because I'm in Christ and Christ is in me. And the Apostle Paul, he actually made it a point of prayer in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 19, when he said, For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant to you according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through the Spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. What is Paul praying? I want, Paul is praying, he's saying, I want all believers to know how much God loves them because it will transform their hearts. It will renew their minds. It will give them purpose in a world that's filled with confusion. It'll give them hope when all things feel hopeless. It'll bring God near when it feels like sometimes he's so far away because I know my God loves me. Jesus loves me. That little kid's song, this I know for the Bible tells me so. We need to let these words sink deep within our hearts. Because maybe you're here tonight and you're thinking, I'm wounded. I've been looking for love. It's left me empty. Not to pile on. Could it be that you've been looking for love, unconditional love in a very conditional world? Come to the one who loves you unconditionally. Now, as I close, I find it interesting that our Savior Jesus Christ, he came from the tribe of Judah. Leah's son, the rejected wife, not Rachel. And I believe the Lord is telling us something through this, that God values you when others do not. So have you been looking for unconditional love in a conditional world? I want to invite you right now to accept God's love so that you may be able to say with Leah, this time, oh, this time, I will praise the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this time. To be reminded of how great your love is for us, that you would send your only begotten son, that whoever would place their faith in him for salvation would not perish, but have everlasting life. Father, I pray for those who've never received Jesus as their Savior, that even right now they would respond to your love by placing their faith in Jesus Christ for salvation. Heal their lives. And I also pray for those who have received Jesus as their Savior, but they feel beaten up by the world, worn down, overcome by the lies, feeling like they have no purpose or value. Father, would you please, right now, heal their heart? Church, even as we pray to the Lord, I want to give you an opportunity to respond. Even if people are with you right now, if you want God to heal your heart, he knows it. He's just waiting for you to ask. Would you just raise your hand and say, Lord, that's me. Heal my heart. I'm done looking for unconditional love in a conditional world. I'm going to run to you, Lord, and experience the fullness of your love. Heal my life. Lord, bless those who have responded to that invitation. Heal those. As only you can. Transform our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen.